Paul now is currently the Director of Engineering at Intelligent Construction Tools, which is a joint venture between Trimble Navigation and Hilti AG. In this role, his objective is to bring accurate and practical indoor positioning to the construction market. Uh, Paul received his PhD, as I said, from Aero Astro from Stanford in 1996 and was uh, subsequently a founding member in Novarian. At Novarian, he worked on GPS receiver technology for aircraft landing, automatic farming, and pseudolite systems. Please welcome Paul Montgomery. Thank you, Tom. And uh, may I say, it's such a pleasure to, to be back. I, I really enjoyed this symposium every year. So it's, it's an honor and a privilege to be able to talk to you. And uh, I'm going to talk to you today about indoor positioning, what I think is accurate indoor positioning, based on cameras. And I'd like to mention that this is also a collaboration with Dr. Winter at uh, Hilti. I don't know if he's here, but he might be somewhere in the building. So ICT, it stands for Intelligent Construction Tools. It's a joint venture between Tremble and Hilti. Hilti is a large European manufacturer of many different things, including anchor systems, uh, many different tools, measuring systems. And I think Trimble needs no introduction, which is a large, uh, you know, it has many different business ventures. But rather key to Trimble's future is the ability to do construction. And this is the, uh, the reason for forming this joint venture. And what they really want to do is create intelligent construction tools, tools that know something about where they are and therefore can take data from the back office and can validate what they've done in the field. And this is to try and improve efficiencies uh, in the construction industry, which today, if you look across the construction industry, uses many very traditional te techniques. And to do that, you'll find that the, the very central problem is the ability to have accurate and robust indoor positioning. I call it pose, and it's sort of a term from uh, camera world, but it means the combination of position and orientation. So I'm going to talk a little bit about ICT in the construction market, very shortly about indoor positioning. The POM concept, which I, I have one here, it's a little camera system that we use for indoor positioning. Uh, the errors that you get, uh, <coughs> some of the problems that you have, and uh, the accuracy that we've been able to achieve in some testing done to date. This picture shows you the general concept, uh, and we do have to put up what we call targets. These are small devices. Uh, I have one in my hand. And because we're in construction, everything's changing all the time. So it's really not possible to survey it and use the features that have been surveyed, because those features will no longer exist tomorrow. So uh, we put up targets, and uh, then we use uh, these bright lights, they're actually IR LEDs, to navigate relative to. The, uh, it's not a new concept. People have thought about this in the past, and I think several people have done something similar. And, but what we've tried to do is make it easy to deploy and inexpensive. I mentioned also there's a couple of different modes that you might go in. Static mode, it's basically when you just stand stationary. Kinematic mode, it's when you're moving around, so you're dynamically changing, like you would with a GPS receiver. And uh, finally, survey mode. And I see Dr. Winter just walked in, so welcome. So a construction site is a, a very unstructured and complex site. This is one we went out to recently. You can see that it's messy. It's, it's, it's got stuff lying around all over the place. And it's changing hour by hour. Uh, the lighting conditions change. So it's really a very challenging uh, environment to work in. And there, there are solutions for this today, and these are well known, although not well utilized. The penetration is small. And part of the reason that the penetration is small is that they're expensive. This is called a robotic total station. It's a device that gives you accurate horizontal angle and vertical angle, and additionally range. So with those three measurements, you can infer the position of a laser point and this is used to lay out buildings, and it can operate out to 100 or more meters with an accuracy of a few millimeters. So they're very capable and good devices, but, but they're expensive, and that limits their application, and their, up, 
their adoption. And uh, it also, even though the device itself is very sophisticated and accurate, it, it requires a good deal of expertise to achieve that accuracy. So they're not simple to use or set up. And they are also for a single user, and they are also subject to line of sight occlusion. So coming from the GPS lab, uh, I was interested to make something that works more similarly to a GPS receiver. It's scalable, many of them can work together, and also that it's much lower cost and has some of the performances that we're used to from a GPS receiver. If you actually go out onto construction sites, you'll see that they mostly use tape measures, spirit levels, laser levels, this kind of thing. So, the requirements. Yeah, somebody comes to you and says, I'd like you to design a system for me that's inexpensive, can measure anywhere in a complex, unstructured environment to six millimeters. Uh, it has to handle things like drop and uh, dirt. Uh, it has to cost less than, well, have a bomb cost less than $400. And it has to be easy to use and somebody with a high school education can do it. So that's, that's what we're dealt with. And when dealing with a hard problem, what we try and do is make it as easy as possible. And to do that, we uh, install these targets. The targets themselves are very bright in the infrared and having carefully surveyed, accurately surveyed, specific points uh, greatly simplifies the problem, but it, it's still a complex problem. I, I show this picture because you can see things hanging from the ceiling, and these are called pipe hangers, and you also see some air conditioning ducts and things like that. This is a sort of thing that happens on a construction site where one trade comes in, needs to install their part of the building, and w what can happen is that they do it to their convenience. Oh, look, there's something convenient to hang my pipe on, and it's just you know, a meter from where it should be. So I'll hang it there. Well, there's no way to validate that until the next trade comes along and says, hmm, I can't put my pipe in where I'm supposed to. So that's the kind of inefficiency that really happens on the building site today. If you go out there, you'll see paper plans, and it's, it's been like it has for many years. So you look firstly at existing solutions. And there are some indoor solutions that exist, and I mentioned this since I like tennis. This is a system which uses cameras installed around to look down on a brightly lit tennis court to identify the path of a easily identified object being a tennis ball. And this system, you might have seen it if you watch TV for making contentious line calls. And uh, it's good to a few millimeters, and it updates at about 60 hertz. And it's very expensive and it requires careful installation and calibration, and it needs cables. It's absolutely not appropriate for a construction site. So that's how we came to this idea of POMA, which uh, my friend Andreas named with his special skill for naming. It stands for Position Orientation Measurement Engine. And the good things about it is that it's multi-user. It can be used indoor and possibly outdoors, and it's low cost relatively, and uh, it's fully solid state, so therefore robust. I have one here in my hand. Uh, it's based on three cameras that look to see all around. And uh, I like to say POMA inside is like GPS outside, in that it has similar power, similar weight, update rate, and accuracy. And there's many potential applications. POMA is a sensor, not an not a application, so of course it can be used in many different ways. And here's uh, some graphics of some ways. I'm particularly interested in this idea of uh, what you might call a drill bot. It's a, a robot that has to drill onto a ceiling. Today, people stand on these things and they hold heavy tools above their head and they, uh, they suffer the consequences, I'm sure. But also, you know, augmented reality, when you overlay onto what exists something that's yet virtual, maybe yet to be built. The ability to do that requires you to have accurate position and accurate orientation. So how does it work? So I could, could show you a lot, of, uh, a lot of equations, but I think this captures the essence of it. Probably in high school you learned that uh, an angle circumscribed in a, in a circle is a constant angle for any chord, as, as shown in the left picture. And the camera is an angle measuring device. So if you measure an angle between two points which are known, 
it puts you on in one circle, as shown. And then if you have a small variation in your angle, then you get a different circle that goes through the chord and it's shown on the right that there's a, a small change in the circle. So if you have several such circles or several angles between several points, you get this intersection of circles and uh, giving you candidate results in this case x and y. And if you're looking close at y, you'll see that the error in angles equates to uncertainty in those circles, which in turn relates to uncertainty in your solution. And you come up with a, a covariance ellipse. And this brings us to the, the important point of this system, which is an angle measuring system, which is how accurately do I have to measure to achieve the specification of six millimeters? So you start to do this work and you, you build a simulation, something like this, and after messing with it for a while, it's an iterative process, you come to the, to the answer with the sort of sensors we're using. I need to achieve 0.2 of pixel one sigma in X and Y to achieve the angle accuracy I need to meet my position specification. And to do that, there's lots of different errors, but one of course is the lenses, can you calibrate them? One is the image sensor, one is the mechanical stability. I mean, a pixel is about 2.2 microns, and we're talking about achieving 0.2 of one pixel uh, is the required stability over, th over thermal. If you, if you take the thermal expansion of aluminium over 10 degrees, you'll see that you violate that depending on how big the object is. Also, we have to determine the centroid of these, we call them blobs, but they're the impulse response of the LEDs. And we have to do that with saturated signals and very weak signals. And of course, if the lenses aren't good, these become quite distorted. Okay. So this is a concept of having these three cameras which have overlapping fields of view, which together give you uh, a complete hemisphere so that you get the strongest possible geometry by having points all around you. Uh, the graphic on the right shows you some of how these three fields of view would overlap. And there's a lot of different things that you, you consider in, in the design. And one of them is the number of pixels and the type of lens that I want to use and uh, the kind of LED that I want to use. Um, the LEDs are very bright, so if they're visible, they'll probably be distracting, so we're using infrared targets. Uh, ultimately, you come down to, can I make something that's small enough and low enough power that it can operate on a battery for several hours? So these are some of the system design considerations that one quickly comes to. So look, looking at each part a little bit individually, if you look at the, the uh, transmitter, the LED, it has an antenna pattern and I use the antenna pattern even though it's uh, from RF perspective, that looks like this. You can see that at zenith it's, uh, it's unity, but it drops rather quickly as you get down to, uh, let's say, 20 degrees off, off the wall. And this goes to the uh, geometry that as you come close to a surface, you, you get poorer visibility and, and reduced signal strength. One of the advantages of using these LEDs is that mathematically, I mean, each LED is maybe a millimeter. So at more than a few meters range, it subtends only sub-pixel on your camera. So what you actually see on your camera is the impulse response of the LED. What that means is that it doesn't matter how you look at it. It looks the same. It's just an impulse response. It's <coughs> scaled according to its power, but it looks no different no matter how you look at it. And that's an important simplifying assumption. Uh, and then this is a picture of, of what a camera is. A camera is a projection from what's called object space onto a two-dimensional uh, image space. And it can be a complex projection depending on the kind of lens you use and distortions which exist in the lens. But at the end of the day, to do positioning, you're interested in the ray vector, which, which is characterized by two dimensions. And there's a mapping from your image sensor to your ray and you want to be able to establish that mapping so that your rays have an accuracy meeting your accuracy specification. Uh, this mapping function is different for every camera and that means that we have to calibrate the cameras. 
Another thing to do is the type of lens that you use. A standard kind of what's called a pinhole projection uh, is as you come close to the well, 90 degrees field of view off the optical axis, you start to need a, a really big image sensor. And so we use something called a fisheye lens or an F theta projection. The advantage of that is shown on the right and it means that you can have a smaller image sensor and, and map very wide. But in addition, it means that an increment in angle equates to an increment in distance on your image sensor. And that means that at some areas of your image sensor, well, the, the accuracy at each point of the image sensor is about equal, which is definitely not the case with a uh, standard projection. So if you haven't seen how F theta lenses look, if you were in a tunnel looking sideways as shown by the arrow, what your camera would show you was the ability to see out both of ends of the tunnel at the same time. So we take three of these lenses and we put them together. We, we actually put them slightly off center in the image sensor uh, to achieve the desired field of view. And I think it's interesting to note that 0.2 of a pixel on this camera lens equates to 50 arc seconds or about a 70th of a degree, which is what we need for our uh, accuracy specification. The next thing that you run into is that if you take off-the-shelf lenses, you find that they have some rather ugly impulse responses. And here are some examples. In the middle of the lens, it looks quite nice, like on the top, top right. And in the, in the bottom is off to the edge of the lens. And uh, it looks quite ugly. What happens, though, is it, as you saturate that, or as you sink that down into the noise, your, your centroid moves dramatically. And so this non-symmetry and non-uniformity of, of the lens uh, greatly adds to your error budget. So we went ahead and we worked with a company called SunX to create a specialized lens. How am I going on time, Tom? Okay. So this is a specialized lens and it's optimized for this purpose for a monochrome light and for mechanical stability. And uh, it also has much more symmetrical impulse responses than we could buy off the shelf. Putting it all together, we get this, what we call a sky plot. And this is a GPS-like image uh, that often used in GPS for showing the satellites. But it shows your three fields of view of the cameras with the center point pointing straight upwards. And so you can see that there's overlapping fields of view between the red, the green, and the blue cameras. And uh, the... Well, as shown, the, the various uh, elevation circles are shown. This is taken from actual application and some targets are seen as uh, superimposed on that. Well, how do these images actually look? Well, if, if you look at them, they look rather uninteresting. <laughs> They're mostly black and they have occasionally some like dots, very, very small dots. And uh, in the top are the three cameras uh, with I've emphasized them so you can see them. The, the blue dots are these targets. And uh, the bottom picture is one which also has some interference in it. And although we have an IR filter, we still, uh, we still get interference because the sun is quite strong in infrared. And so the challenge that you have is to discern which of these dots is a dot of interest and with which target to associate it. We call that problem registration. And also to reject all of the interferences that we can see in this photograph. So how do some of these blobs look? Well, they are the sampled impulse responses. And this would be a rather nice looking one. And you can see if you smooth it, it looks somewhat Gaussian. But uh, I have some other pictures where they're saturated. And what we're trying to do is determine the centroid of this uh, with high accuracy. That is our fundamental measurement. I'm not going to talk too much about calibration, but the main thing is that you're calibrating each lens to achieve the mapping with the accuracy that you desire. The other thing that you get into is uh, thermal variation. And so quite a lot of work was done, mostly by Andreas, about shock and vibration testing to look at the stability of the mechanics over time and temperature. And uh, this was one of the ways we did it. We built up a set of collimated laser beams that shot into each of these cameras and in, in a form factor that we could put into a thermal chamber and thermally cycle. 
And by doing this, we, we saw that with standard manufacturing techniques and standard electronics uh, fabrication, we can come to the mechanical stability that we require. So then you have some usual problems. I talked about calibration and stability, and, and really, I would say that those are the essence of, of the problems that we face. But in addition, we have these range ratio, the dynamic range. We have some very close targets and some quite far. And that's compounded by the uh, potential obliquity to the LEDs. We also have some interferences. That's, you saw some targets coming in through the window in the previous photograph. Uh, you have multipath, which is uh, y you have reflective objects uh, and you can see targets sometimes more than once. And uh, sometimes you cannot see the direct line of sight, but only the reflected path. So these are the standard problems that one is familiar with uh, in, a, in a different domain. Of course, you have the problem of initialization. And I wouldn't say we have a complete solution to this. Certainly in a room of mirrors, you, you have this combinational problem. And uh, it, it's not one that we would be able to initialize. But once you have initialized, being able to track an individual target is quite good as compared to an RF array where you really have no idea where it's coming from. With a camera, you have a very precise idea where it's coming from. And so your ability to filter geometrically is greatly enhanced. And I think that's one of the great advantages of an optical solution to an RF solution. So we did some testing and I'm just going to finish up talking about the results of testing. <coughs> this was a warehouse that we did it in. You can see it's got some lights, uh, windows with sun coming through. It's got fluorescent lights. It's a reasonably unstructured space. And we had a, a test or a, a, a truth system based on a, a laser ranger, a Hilti PLT. The size was about 15 by 10 meters. Another picture, we had a robot that we built that ran around in this space. And the idea was to build up a, a lot of measurements and so that we could make some statistically valid claims about the accuracy in a large number of points. Uh, this picture shows you the, the path on the, on the top right. We, we ran around this, uh, this path and we collected, I think there was 48 different points where we, the robot moved to, position stations I call them. And at each position station, we rotated the head uh, into 16 different azimuths. And we took data at each of those points, and we were able to compare it to our truth system. And I could show you a big page of numbers, but it's, it's actually more instructive to look at this. And this is data that was taken at the location with the triangle. And each of these plots, the, the green shows you the smattering that we got. Uh, so the truth, according to our truth system, is a black cross, which is visible in all of these pictures. Uh, the grid here is, I think it's two, two millimeters by two millimeters is a square grid. And uh, at each of the azimuth stations, of which there are 16, we got the, the blue smatter. So, so what you see is that you know, overall, the accuracy is a few millimeters, maybe five millimeters. But uh, at any given azimuth station, you can see the covariance associated with the noise on each of these signals. So there are systematic effects which are, are dominating, and we still haven't really resolved them. You know, it's, it's not easy to find them. So, but, but I think this picture shows you both the underlying accuracy that can be achieved by the system as it stands today, and the fact that if you could solve these systematic errors, you'd get really millimeter level performance with this size of a room. So my boss always comes to me and says, what's the accuracy of the system? And I always say to him, it depends. <laughs> and uh, he doesn't like that answer. And it does depend. So the reason it depends is that at each point in every room, you have some errors or statistics which are characterized by these covariance ellipses. You have two three-dimensional covariance ellipses. And if you ask me 
how good is it? I say, well, where? And point it in what direction? And do you want the best or the worst? And that's not an answer he understands. So, so what we do is we say, let's try and characterize it by looking at the worst direction, position uncertainty, and the worst direction, azimuth uncertainty, as a two-dimensional function across the room. Uh, so what we do is we, we plot that. So for various candidate designs uh, or target, you might call them canonical target situations. Uh, one that I think is, I'm going to show is the eight target situation. And that's something that I think is probably reasonably practical. Uh, our specification is 0.2 of a pixel one sigma. In fact, what we achieved in practice was about 0.5 of a pixel on average one sigma. So these simulation results then apply to this L more conservative uh, number, 0.5 pixels, one sigma. And what you get on this 10 by 10 meter space with the eight targets, you get a picture that looks like this. Once again, this is one sigma results in the worst direction. It's plotted in a color map and in, in millimeters, and it's the same data is plotted as a contour map. So the top row are the worst direction, one sigma position errors and the bottom one are the worst direction, one sigma orientation errors. And, uh, so, and they're, they're in arc seconds. So basically you can see that you're good to two to four millimeters over most of the space. This is the same situation where you sit there, instead of taking one measurement, you rotate it in four times an average. Of course, if, if you can do that, you can uh, benefit from averaging. So you see improved performance, uh, at least in simulation, when you do that. So that's the end of the presentation. Uh, I hope I'll have time for a couple of questions. But in terms of looking to the future of indoor positioning, I I'm very optimistic that the case for cameras, which are mobile, using low-cost infrastructure is, th is the way it will work out. Uh, today we use... Uh, infrastructure that we have to install. It's necessary uh, because we need to reference off something and unless we can know a priori, then you know, <laughs> we cannot make a system that works. I think what will happen is that, uh, that the requirement to install a larger number of targets will be mitigated and there will be the ability to just install two or three but those will form a coordinate basis with which natural features can be referenced. And then you'll be able to use those in addition to the natural features to, uh, to create indoor positioning that's robust with minimum need for infrastructure. So that is the, uh, the talk. Thank you very much. Paul, thanks for the talk. Um, on, uh, in daily use by a construction firm, how would you anticipate the targets being surveyed in at the beginning of the project? I, I promise you I didn't pay him. <laughs> it's a great question. What this is, it's an accurate angle measuring system. And so we want to use this to be the basis of, uh, of that answer. If you can take this and rotate it in a space, so if, if you take some targets and you simply mag mount them or stick them to surfaces of convenience, that's a relatively simple thing to do and, and these will operate on batteries for several days. Then you need to survey it. Uh, today we use a robotic total stay or total station, but if you add to this the additional, the ability to range it, range to targets, then two angles and ranges, you can uh, create a large matrix and you can solve it for the three, three coordinates of each target. Uh, that is something that we're actively working on uh, at this time. The, the idea is to be able to use this low cost device to create a low cost system without needing this expensive piece of infrastructure. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't really have a question. Uh, what I have is a comment. Uh, 
people in this room don't know, but you have to have been one of the most persistent, wonderful technology students I ever had. And I will say this, that your persistence is going to make this work. And congratulations on a very, very nice presentation. Thank you, Brent. One more question, Gaylord. I, I have to comment, following Brad and, and Tom, I use uh, Paul Montgomery as a why satellites take so long to what build. A question. <laughs> Here was the ultimate entrepreneur. But he was risk adverse because if he lost his model that he spent lots of, a lot of time on, he didn't want to lose it, so he would run lots of tests. And even, even at that, he still had uh, a, a few mishaps. But he, uh, he is the ultimate entrepreneur, and the reason satellites take so long is you're not risk adverse because once you launch them, they're gone. And so I use him as an example on why satellites take so long. <laughs> Last question. Uh, I'm very impressed. I like these ideas and I'm enthused about optics again. Mm -hmm. But um, so it looked like from your maps, your point spread functions were pretty tight, but the offsets had systematic biases. Do you speculate is that optical aberrations or thermomechanical or? I can speculate. Uh, you, you know, I've been looking for it. Uh, w one thing I will say is that we are using extremely low-cost sensors. Uh, we are trying to make an inexpensive uh, device. And you can buy image sensors that cost many hundreds of dollars. And these would be a great help in dynamic range, in, in sort of black level, and, and many other aspects. But these are the really dirt cheap sensors. So, of course, calibration is critical. Of course, if you've calibrated if you then change it by thermal expansion or other things, this ruins your map or, or, or degrades it. So that's definitely one area that, that is suspect. Uh, the other is the fact that some targets, with these image sensors at least, are very weak and others are saturated. And of course, your ability to determine the centroid in those circumstances uh, is, uh, reduced. And so that's another source of errors. The other is the truth system. It's actually very hard to build a truth system where you can find a point in space to millimeter accuracy as you move around and also know the orientation. And we have to project from a laser reference point to the what we call the assembly origin of our POM head. And so we have to know the orientation. To know the orientation and the accurate, with the accuracy that we desire in a room it is not so easy to build. So it, it's another suspect point. The answer is I don't know right now. Okay, thank you very much.